Okay. I need some help. Now, my wife will tell you that, yes, I've needed help for a long time now. But seriously, uh, I have this uh, chart over here over my shoulder that I'll show you. Let me give you a, a quick preview, then I'll explain where I'm going with this. Um, as you can see in the, in the blue writing in the upper left-hand corner, Trumpets is not before the fall. Okay, it's a fall feast. Now, on the secular calendar, they're trying to tell us that, uh, you know, what they call Rosh Hashanah, really the true biblical feast day is Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. Uh, most of you know this, but I'm just going to repeat myself in, in some of these areas, not to talk down to anybody, but for those who maybe are new to it or haven't heard anything at all uh, about it, but the rule is this, um, it's a it's a fall feast. Months in the Hebrew calendar, in, in biblical reckoning, start on the new moon. A new moon is a brand new moon. In, in other words, it's not a, a new moon in, in the Western culture is, you know, the big round black ball. I mean, you could see it in the sky. You know, oh, look, a new moon, you can't really see it. Depends on the lighting, where you're at, what have you. In Hebrew reckoning, it's the first sliver of a, mu of a moon that you're able to sight. And that marks off the new moon. A couple of witnesses attest to that. The new moon begins. Now, what's particular about... Um, the Feast of Trumpets is unlike the other feasts, which all land on full moons, really obvious, in your face kind of a deal, right? Yom Teruah, or Feast of Trumpets, is the new moon, first sliver of a moon. Now, what is really particularly difficult about um, knowing when that is, is what has just happened um in the skies is the autumnal equinox that's when the sun passes over the equator and all those alignments happen in such a way that um, it's the equinox you have a vernal equinox and you have that right before passover you have the autumnal equinox and that's when you know even according to nasa that tells you oh this is when autumn starts fall okay on the Gregorian calendar, which is the everyday calendar that we use, um, that will be on the 22nd or 23rd every year. That's just because that's a solar thing. Um, the Jews use a, a lunar solar calendar. In other words, it's the moon, except where it comes to the breaking of the seasons, and then that determines the months. So you've got it split up into four times of the year, and there's all kinds of Hebrew terms for my head is swimming reading all this stuff um, to refresh myself but to determine when we're in the right season summer fall winter spring um, we will follow the equinox and so what happens with Yom Teruah is it's the first new moon after the fall equinox because it's not fall until we've hit the equinox, it says, okay, summer's done. It's now fall. First new moon starts the first um, of the month. Um, in this case, it's going to be Tishri. And that Tishri 1 will start as soon as two witnesses up at the highest point spot this little sliver of moon. Now, what's really particularly difficult about it, and there have been tons of videos done about this, so I'm not going to belabor it, but... Um, it's at, at a time of the year where the sun set is the same place as the moon rise. So the sun is going down over the horizon and the moon pops up briefly, makes a showing before going back down and you have the glare of the sun. So the first day, uh, they might miss it. You have a couple of witnesses on a high point. It's a really good chance they'll, mi they'll miss this little, you know, uh, sliver of a moon. So... Um, that's why 
in the Hebrew reckoning, reckoning a, a Hebraism is it's the feast that no man knows. No man knows the day or the hour. Does that sound familiar? No man knows the day or the hour. If they miss this first sliver of the moon the first night, then that means Yom Teruel will start the second night. And it's, it looks kind of like a three-day. If you look at your calendar, it'll look like a three-day holiday on your calendar, but really it's two days. But see, their days run from evening, you know, the sunrise till, um, you know, the sunset of the next day. Ours is morning to night. Another way you might look at it is we run from midnight to midnight, and their their reckoning is not like that at all. It's more like sunset. Sunset to sunset is another way you could look at it. It's a couple of ways you could look at it, but it's it's different from ours. So um, when you get to it, as at the time I'm recording this, um, it is um, Friday afternoon. By the time it gets to be probably 6.45, 7 o'clock, wherever sunset is tonight. Um, when you get to sunset there, we are now at, on the Sabbath or Saturday as we look at it here in the Western culture. So it, the day changes in the evening is the best way to look at it. Other than thinking about it, clocks and midnight and whatever. Um, the day of the week changes at, at sunset. And so we, we go into a new a new day. So, that, so it looks like... A three-day celebration on your calendar. You look at it and go, oh, look at, you know, um, Rosh Hashanah is these three days. But really what it is is it's there's overlap and it doesn't really look too well on the calendar. So it looks like three days. But it's a two-day celebration. Anyway, um, so 2023, the time in question. I, I need some help here. I need some folks who are good at math and calendars and all that kind of stuff and it just makes i have a head cold right now so my head is kind of swimming um coffee helps a little bit but anyway um they have us in september as the start of what they're calling rosh hashanah which is wink wink nudge nudge really it's yom teru rosh hashanah means head of the year then the original feast day is it has to do with trumpets. And what it does is it's calling attention to Israel, and it kicks off 10 days of awe. 10 days of awe, repenting, and um, that the 10 days of, of uh, awe will culminate on um, Tishri 10, which will be a one-day celebration, and it's um, the end of 10 days of repentance. So Tishri 1, Rosh Hashanah, calls everybody to attention, and it's 10 days of repentance, 10 days of awe, 10 days of contemplation, um, but there's also some celebration and so forth. And um, so as there's 10 days of repentance that culminate on Tishri 10, obviously, on the 10th day of the month, and that's Yom Kippur, okay? And then um, five days after that, that's a one-day celebration. Then five days after that is a seven-day holiday called Sukkot or Tabernacles. Okay? These are all fall feasts. September 15, 16, 17, whatever is still summer. Um, not just in the Hebrew calendar. And not it's not a Hebrew calendar versus Gregorian calendar kind of a thing necessarily. But, you know, NASA, it's astronomy, not astrology. It's astronomy. It's the position, uh, and you can find charts. I don't know if I have time. I might cut a graphic in here, um, but it's it's how the the moon in relation to the tilt of the Earth position themselves for the four seasons, and and they change between solstices and equinoxes um, four times a year. That's how you get the four seasons. So that does not even happen until September twenty second this year. But you have Rosh Hashanah happening at the end of summer. And the reason why the secularists do this kind of thing, too, is to make the weekend land the right day because, um, you know, you want to have those good punch of uh, marketing days to have people holidays and buying things and, and going to restaurants and spending money and, and not having to work and that kind of stuff. So they monkey with the dates sometimes. Um, for their purposes. Um, 
and it's, it has nothing to do with biblical um, Yom Teruah at all. Yom Teruah is the first new moon of, of fall. Fall holiday, it's first first new moon. And that will be October 14th. October 14th. Let me go back to this chart again here real quick. Um, as you can see here, um, October 14th is the first day of the first new moon right here. That's Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets. So I do not believe in setting dates. <clears throat> I think that's a huge mistake. We've all seen how that's gone disastrously. People have done that even recently. Even now, people are still doing it. And, and some people are claiming to have visions. Some people are claiming to have dreams. And as they have in previous years, and how did that work out? Now, I want to keep it biblical. But I'm a watcher. I like to watch. I'm watching for the Lord. As Paul said, Titus 2.13, looking for the glorious appearing of my great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm watching for Messiah. I'm done with this earth. Now, I don't know how many of you agree with me there, but this place is just, you know, stick a fork in this, we're done. It's so evil, it's so vile. And frankly, I'm tired of my own sin too, right? I'm tired of, of struggling uh, in, in life with, um, you know, with my own sin. And I want to be holy and righteous all the time for the Lord. And um, that's, that could be a problem because sometimes we don't always want to be holy, right? We want to be self-indulgent. We just want to watch this show. I want to watch this movie. Yeah, there's some language in it, but, you know, so we struggle with these things. And, and some people don't. Different people have different struggles in different ways. But, you know, um, but it's mostly from the outside um, the evil going on in the world. And I don't care if you're looking at politics and military and it, it, uh, politics from one country to the next and attacking each other and <clears throat> manipulating things and and monetarily trying to control us, the tyranny that's going on in the world, the tyranny that is uh, ramping up big time here in the United States. So, you know, bring it, Jesus, you know, um, rapture, bring us out of here. So I'm looking at dates because I'm curious but um, there's some interesting things that I want you to I want to point out on this chart that I'd like you to help me with because um, I think there's some amazing coincidences, and um, I, I'm I'd like to believe it's this year. It might be this year, but the the truth is, when we look at this chart, um, what we might find is that we can maybe line up with some math some of these things in future years too. And I just have not done that to this extent yet. Okay, so here's the deal. How, what am I looking at here? Okay. Uh, as I said, fall equinox, September 22nd. First new moon is not until October 14, 15, depending on when they sound it, when they uh, cite it, because uh, no man knows the day or the hour, right? It's the feast that no man knows. So depending on when the two witnesses about the high point um, in Israel see this first sliver of the moon. And it, it's really, this stuff's all about Jerusalem. It's all about Israel, right? So, what I have listed here is trying to keep it biblical. There are some key dates and and time period ranges. Well, what do you mean by time period ranges? Well, we all know 70th week of Daniel. Um, a, a week is a, a group of sevens. It's like, well, here in the West, we would say a dozen. Okay, a dozen means any grouping of 12. There's a dozen eggs, a dozen donuts. My preference is the donuts. Um, but it's it means 12, okay? When we say a week, it's a Hebraism for a grouping of seven. And, and in, we are most familiar with a week being seven days. That's a grouping of seven. But sevens can be groupings also of years. And as Gabriel described events and as they transpired in Daniel, I'm not going to get into all that right now because that would take several more videos, but you can suss that out yourself. Daniel was given by Gabriel a prophecy wherein there's 70 weeks and 69 of those weeks um, terminated at Christ on the cross. That left a week out. And I know some people like to mock and say, why would you have that 70th week way out in the future? Well, you know, um, riddle me this, Batman. Why did Jesus give us a 2,000-year gap when he was reading Isaiah 61 in the temple? And he took the Isaiah scroll, read 
concerning the things he would accomplish in his first coming, and he stopped at kind of a comma in Isaiah 61. Because the rest of the verse in Isaiah 61 is about the second coming and the things he'll do there. Similarly, Gabriel, when he visited um, Mary in the Gospel of Luke, he did the same kind of thing and told Mary what was coming and how she's going to um, bear a, a son. And his name will be Emmanuel, all these types of things that we read there in Luke. Uh, and then 2,000 years later, although it doesn't say that in there, but there's a gap, he's going to sit on the throne of David. So this is how the prophecy goes. So anyway, let me go back here. So prophecies frequently do this. In fact, they usually do this. They'll have a gap. They'll have a near fulfillment, which, which is partial, and then they'll have an ultimate, complete fulfillment sometime out in the future, just as with Christ's first coming, and then the second coming is finally um, him sitting on the throne of David. So here... Um, what I'm curious about, though, is, okay, there are some time spans, time frames here offered in the book of Revelation in particular. We have, again, a Daniel, we have a seven-year period. But what all happens in this seven-year period? Um, in the seven-year period, we have, the, um, in the middle of the week, we have... Um, the Antichrist comes along and stops the sacrifices. What's interesting about that is what do you have to have to what do you what do I think of, what do you have to have before you can have sacrifices? You've got to have the temple, and you have to have the altar. So that means an, a temple is coming, right? And the Antichrist is going to have to be here by then. And Jesus referred to the middle of the week, the abomination of desolation, is called in Daniel, and Jesus referred to it and said. It's still in the future, even though history tells us that there was a foreshadowing about 200 years before Christ. Um, he said, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. So it's a completed, fulfilled version of this still happens in the future. So that's interesting. So that's one thing to throw into the mix here. I'm just going to give you the elements of the mix. So we have a seven year period here. But now, here's the thing about this seven-year period. We would think if all math was nice round numbers and all calendars were perfectly good and the Earth was uh, upright on, uh, you know, zero degrees north and zero degrees south and the rotation around the sun was perfect, then, you know, you could say, uh, you know, uh, January 1st at this point, 2023 is going to match up with January 1st, 2030, and it's going to be the exact number of days. Everything's going to be exact, the exact correct number of months, and so forth. We look at the solar cal calendar, and th this is what historically they've struggled with trying to balance over the years, and this is how Pope Gregory messed up the calendar. The calendar has been messed up like three major times in the past. That's why you go back trying to figure out when, when did Jesus raise from the dead, when is the cross, and there's why there's so much heated argument and debate about how all that happened. You've got uh, Rome back before Christ came up with a 365 point odd, 365 and a quarter uh, day year. And they had at the time when it was Rome, they had a, a 10 month calendar and they added and they played with the years. You know, you had uh, Julius Caesar added July. And Augustus, not to be outdone, decided he wanted his own month too. And they messed with the months. And so now what we've got um, away from the Julian calendar and so forth, we've got the Gregorian calendar that's been slightly altered. So we have 365 day years, 4.3 roughly weeks in a month. Month is 29, 30, sometimes 19 days. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a mess. They have the Hebrew and Babylonian calendar and it's 360 day year. It's still 12 months. 30-day months, but nowadays, though, because there's drift and the days um, tend to drift, they add in some um, leap months in Adar 1 uh, on certain years. 
And if you research this out, you'll find this and find out what years those are. Okay, so this is why uh, you can't look at it and say, okay, uh, from Feast of Trumpets, one year, let's say it's this year, out seven years, it's going to be exactly Feast of Trumpets again. No. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't work out there. You find a year that works out that way, you let me know. I'd love to have the computer crunching power that does all this and does it accurately. Because they have to account for um, the solar positions for the four seasons plus the moon. Because there's the lunar part of the calendar that uh, the Bible goes by, the biblical calendar and the Hebrew calendar goes by. And so it's it's um, it's a mess trying to crunch these, marry these up and get them together. So these are the old, this is what I have to mess with. And if you've got, if you're a geek and you've got, got all that worked out, I'd like to see what you come up with. But now let's, let's go back to this chart that's over my shoulder here. So we have two witnesses, and it says in Revelation 11 that they're going to do their thing for 1260 days. Now, if you note down here, I put it roughly starting um, in the first half of the tribulation. Why? Um, I realize that they don't start telling you about the two witnesses until we get up close to the middle of the book of Revelation. Um, but I put place it here because of the events that are going on. One is at the end of their ministry is when the beast, Satan, attacks them and kills them and they're in the streets for four days, right? Now, what is going on for four days they're in the streets? Uh, the Bible says that they are uh, partying, they're exchanging gifts, they make a holiday out of woo -woo, those two witnesses that were, you know, so negative, those naysayers that were bringing plagues upon the earth and everything, they're dead. Yay! And they're partying, and they're exchanging gifts, they're having all kinds of fun, a big celebration, and that's in the middle of the tribulation. In my opinion, it's the middle of the tribulation. And the reason why I think that's got to be the middle of the tribulation is because, let's say the two witnesses were at the end. At the end of the tribulation, we've had by this time, more than half the world has been destroyed, right? Most everybody's dead. Look at you've got the you're at the end of the bowl judgments. You've got Armageddon is here. I'm um, going on at the end of the tribulation. Um, you've got the sun has fired off uh, a, a, a major CME, so it's fried a bunch of people. A bunch of people are burned. You've had hundred pound hail falling on the earth. Uh, oh. All the water, by this time, all the water has turned to blood. Uh, major earthquakes, a series of major earthquakes, all of the islands have sunk and all of the mountains have been leveled. Not really a party atmosphere, is it? And and what will the condition of the world be in communication, whether it's by satellite, cell phone, whatever, what will it be like here? Now, in the middle of the tribulation, what you see is um, when the two witnesses suddenly stand up on their feet and they ascend into heaven, the whole world sees that happen. Well, that means communications are still going to be in good shape. All the satellites and people will have their devices and things still working and people will have their cell phones out going, look at that, it's left, they're standing up, and then videoing them ascending up into heaven. And they're going to be freaked out. I don't really see this atmosphere being this way. So it makes sense that right off, right off the bat, they would come into the uh, seven year period. Now, I kind of, what you'll note here is 1260 days, but I kind of count backwards from the middle to here and you, you end up basically at, at Yom Kippur, um, at, at Tishri 10, 10 days in. Um, and the reason why is because it's more than 1260 days here and it's a little more than 1260 days here gee dave how does that work well because when you go by a seven year and you say seven years out um because of the leap years you've got a longer period you in this case in this case you've got three leap years you got a couple going on here see here's my leapers 20 24 25 um and then 
2027 at the start of the year somewhere right before here is another adara one and then 2030, you've got another leap year that happens up in here. So you're kind of extending this period out to make it fit the combination of um, solar issues plus lunar issues and to make them match up. That's why calendaring is such a big ball of mess. I hope I, I make myself clear. So you've got more than 1260 plus 1260 days in here. In fact, if you look down here, if you go from Yom Teruah on October 14th, you go out um, 200, uh, 2,550 days all the way to Yom Kippur here, um, which is, when you look at Daniel, there are some dates and numbers there that I have not gone into and charted all of them yet. So there's some, some considerations that bring you way out here. This would be Yom Teruah here to Yom Teruah here, um, Yom Kippur here, and then Tabernacles way out here. And this whole period here ends up being a seven year period. So, you, did you ever wonder why does the Lord give us these dates in terms of um, 1260 days to two witnesses? They're going to minister on the earth 1260 days. Then the woman is nourished. She's fleeing from Antichrist, beast, Satan, going after the woman, Israel. And she's got to flee to Petra, whatever, the mountains. And the Lord says he's going to nourish her for a time, times, and half a time. So three and a half years from here to out, wherever, and wherever that starts, whenever Satan falls is kicked down to earth because we read in Revelation 12, there's a war in heaven, I believe is going on right now, probably since Revelation 17. Remember that sign? That's Revelation 17 sign. If you keep reading in the book, it's less about um, some big sign about the rapture and all this kind of stuff as it is about when war in heaven kicks off and what the conditions are. And the war in heaven kicks off in Revelation 12, and Michael stands up, he gets permission from the Lord to finally take care of this guy because he's been creating so much trouble. Satan still has access to the throne, just like he did in Job 1 and 2, accusing the saints. Ever before the throne of grace, accusing the saints. God's like, take care of that, would you, Michael? Michael does, and effectively clips Michael's wings. Michael is cast, Michael, I'm sorry, Satan is cast to the earth, and he's condemned to the earth now to walk on the earth. So he's angry. He's very angry. In his anger, he does as he did with Judas, and he possesses the Antichrist at, the, at this point. This might be somewhere where in here, Antichrist, you know, some weird stuff happens with Antichrist. Anyway, then the two witnesses here, so Satan possesses Antichrist, kills the two witnesses, they resurrect. He goes into the temple. He's working with the false prophet at this point, erecting the image of the beast. Um... The, he uh, desecrates the temple, all that stuff happens, and in his anger, he, now he's got a scorched earth policy, he starts going after Israel. Meanwhile, Israel is seeing this stuff happen with this guy and the way he desecrates the temple. You go, wait a minute. Then those two witnesses and the 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe of Israel, those guys were right. And the Lord opens their eyes to see that this was a false Messiah. This isn't the guy because our Messiah wouldn't do this. I'm not, our Messiah is supposed to bring us the temple and and our, our temple is, you know, for the glory of God. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, we know the, in the church today, the, 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 our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The church is the temple of the Holy Spirit, is, um, is what we're told. But the Jews, remember, they're under a delusion. They're blinded at this point, Romans chapter 11. So they think they've got their true Messiah all through the first half here and they because he built them their temple and stuff. Then he does something very unmessiah like and he goes in and desecrates the temple, right? So he does that and they go, you know, and he starts waging war on the people of the book. Uh, new believers by this point, people have come to Christ. By this point, uh Romans eleven is getting fulfilled and so many so many Old Testament passages are being fulfilled about the Jews now, their eyes being opened and then coming realizing that Wow, Jesus was the real Messiah. So they're converting. And the Bible says in Zechariah that 
a remnant stay behind. Two thirds of the Jews stay behind in Israel, but um, in Jerusalem, um, I think it's, if I remember right, I'm going to confuse the two. Uh, there's like uh, half of Jerusalem maybe repents, and then one third of Israel repents, um, something like that. So anyway, there's a remnant. This remnant, it says in Revelation 12, flees for the mountains. We're going forward here. They flee for the mountains. And Satan sends a flood, you know, a flood of army after them. But God miraculously opens up the ground and swallows them, and he protects them and nourishes them. He nourishes them for, right here, Israel is nourished in Revelation 12 for uh, 1260 days or a time, times and half a time. So notice these are given in terms of days or time, time and half a time. But then the beast system um, that happens after this, once all this begins, it's got to terminate by the second coming because that's when Satan is bound uh, in chains for a thousand years. So that says 42 months. Now, you normally you'd say uh, 42 months, 12, 12 months, seven years, you know, it'd be 84 months or something, you know, so you'd say 12 but it's, remember, we've got leap months in there and things. So it messes things up and there's extra days and so forth. So it's kind of messes with your head and messes with your math. And I hate math. So anyway, we've got, we've got a few extra days in here. So 42 months, it's not 42 months from here to here or 42 months from here to here. Notice the wording of the Lord gives on this for the beast system is different. So he makes war with them 42 months. But it's interesting that from this period of Pesach, uh, which is going to be April, it's going to be um, Passion Week in the middle of the seven-year period. So when you take that and you count it out uh, 42 months, it's going to come out where it'll end maybe when the second coming is. You know, uh, there's going to be a few days in there. So we have the end of trumpets is here, but you got Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, um, which ends the 10 days of awe right here. How long is it going to take? Jesus is going to come down and he's going to go through Edom and out down toward uh, Moab. It says he's going to circle around. Probably that's where Petra is. And he's going to round up the saints who've been hiding out there. And then he's going to set his foot on the Mount of Olives. And then he's going to take care of the people in Armageddon. And that's the grapes of wrath. And it describes in the Bible how he's going to have blood splattered up uh, on his on the horse's hooves and on the bottom of his robe and so forth. So there's some squishy days in here to, to figure out what happens exactly when. And I don't know this. The Bible's not real clear on some of these things as far as what holy days or between holy days these events take place. At the end of this too, the Valley of Decision. We have Joel. The Valley of Decision, or Matthew 24, uh, sheep and goats. So the sheep are on his right and the goats are on his left uh, of those who survived the tri tribulation period. And they are judged. And then we have tabernacles, the very end is tabernacles dwellings. And this is when the, uh, tradition tells us Jesus was probably born on the Feast of Tabernacles. Could be. But I know he's going to come down when he comes down, down this after the end of the tribulation, he's going to tabernacle with us forever and ever, right? And this is what we're promised, and this is what Israel is promised. Um, Israel is told um, that David would, that Jesus would sit on the throne of David, and uh, also we're told uh, the Jews were told in the Old Testament numerous verses, places like, "You will dwell where your fathers dwelt." And you will walk where your fathers walk forever and ever. So old Jerusalem, they're going to be in old Jerusalem. Um, the temple is described in Ezekiel 40 through 48. And it's told it's going to be built by Branch himself, which is a messianic name for the Messiah. So Jesus is going to build that temple. Very detailed eight chapters in Ezekiel about what that temple is going to be like. And it's going to be to commemorate his work and his redemption and his work on the cross. Um, and then we have, um, why wow, there's so many verses about that full restoration that happens and it's going to be forever, but then it's also going to be new Jerusalem. So new Jerusalem 
remember Jesus went away in John 14 and he told him, I'm going to go to my father's house and prepare a place for you. This is all part of Hebrew wedding tradition. So he's up there preparing this place. And now we, we keep saying to the Lord, even so come quickly. And it's like in Revelation, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But in the Hebrew wedding tradition, it's the father who scopes out the dwelling place because he's more experienced than his son. And he'll look around and he'll say, well, he'll make a suggestion. You know, those cabinets are too high for your wife. She's a little one, right? You should probably lower those. So the father would, would make uh, suggestions about changes. So finally, yeah, after about, you know, a year, um, and this, this, his son has been, the bridegroom has been working on this place. At some point, and some, frequently about midnight, just for a bit of fun, the father will tell the bridegroom, go take your bride. So this is when the taking takes place. The, the bridegroom gets his best man, in this case, John the Baptist, and rounds up his wedding party, and they go part way. They don't go all the way to the bride's house. They just go maybe as far as the gate. The bridesmaids or virgins are out at the gate and they're watching and waiting. And she's the bride has made herself ready. Her clothing, her clothing of white is ready. Her trousseau is prepared. She's ready to go. And they kind of know it's been about the right amount of time. And they kind of know the season, right? She'd be watching. And they kind of know the season. And so they watch. And there's all kinds of racket. The bridegroom, his party is making there's all kinds of noise to blow the shofar. Uh, they're banging on things. They're shouting. As they approach the house, the best man is shouting, um, behold the bridegroom. And um, so then she, the bride, comes out and meets partway at the gate. And then from the gate, they go to the father's house and they're locked in. They're shut in for a week, a week of celebration. At the end of the celebration, um, they come out, just as Jesus comes down to the earth and the bride returns with him, now wife returns with him. And so after the sheep and goats then, at the end of the tribulation, what ends up happening is, is uh, I mean, a lot of people get this wrong, that is the marriage supper of, of the Lamb. You have a marriage celebration for seven years in heaven, the official marriage supper that's more public happens at the end when the father's doors are open. Uh, she is again bailed for, again, mostly for a bit of fun. And the bride and bridegroom, now husband and wife, step out, step out the door. And it's announced, um, behold the bride, now wife. And that's, you'll read that at the end of Revelation. And the guests, that's when they come in. And those will be the survivors um, the bleeding survivors who came through the tribulation and through the great tribulation, the whole tribulation week, plus that is the resurrection at that point too, um, right before this point, um, will be all the Old Testament saints get their glorified bodies. And they are all guests. And it's a big, massive marriage supper of the Lamb is opened up to the guests and everybody is celebrating because what's going to happen at this point, Jesus is saying, um, behold, I make all things new, and he's paradise lost. All these thousands of years are becoming paradise found, and it's going to be renewed. Everything is going to be renewed and restored. The creation is going to be restored back to the way it was, um, back uh, as pristine as it was during the garden. So uh, that's kind of the order of events. And again, um, take a look at this, and... I don't know if you've been able to kind of capture these dates and look at these here. Um, I put down some some key scriptures on here. Um, we've got some Daniel 8 stuff going on here with 2300 days that are mentioned in Daniel. But I also put some Gog and Magog stuff in here because um, Gog and Magog is a time of wrath. We read in Ezekiel um, 38 about God's fury and his anger and his wrath and how he leads Gog in by the nose. And uh, we can't be here for wrath. Well, that's, but yet at the same time, we know that there is, um, it's going to be seven years of burning weapons. That's why Gog and Magog can't happen in the middle or at the end, because we're not going to have the burning of weapons anywhere going into the kingdom age on earth, going into the millennium. 
So it's got to happen early on, and it's probably why the Antichrist steps in and this war gets stopped, and he's able to carve out a peace agreement and build the temple for the Jews. And it's going to be a guy who comes from the tribe of David because I've asked some rabbis. This is something you might do sometime. I know the, the rabbis out there, most of them are not believers. But you want to get their perspective on how things are going to happen. That's why people say, oh, I think, you know, the Antichrist, he might be a Muslim. No. Ask a Jew. Most Jews will tell you, no, there's, there's no way. And I, I did this. I, I, I emailed a bunch of rabbis and I asked them. And I've got the emails communicated with them. Oh, what, are you look, what are you looking for in the Messiah? I mean, they're saying, without fail, they're saying, well, with the exception of a liberal uh, rabbi who says, ah, I don't know if any of that stuff's going to happen at all. Okay, But anyway, the rest of the, the uh, rabbis that I got heard back from, they're looking for somebody from the tribe of Judah. He's got to be of the line of David. That takes care of all the Muslims, right? They're out of there. And he will build our temple. And that's what they say without fail every time. Tribe of Judah, line of David, will build our temple. That one. Leaves Muslims out of the pictures. They're not going to accept a Messiah who's from the nations out there. It's going to be, you know, tribe of Judah. That's what's prophetically is told it's supposed to be. So that's what they're looking for. They've got that much right. They're still going to pick the wrong guy, right? So anyway, th this is the stuff. Um, I, I'm kind of rambling here. Forgive me. Like I said, I've got a headache and my head's kind of swimming going through all these numbers. But you guys, I hope you geek out on this a little bit. Uh, Maybe tighten this up. Help me figure out uh, what things in here I might have radically incorrect. Um, and, uh, you know, respond. I'll try to leave, I'll leave the comments open, too. Maybe we can do a better version of this. Maybe somebody who's really got some stuff going on in his head or her head for calendars will we'll be able to work all this out and work the math out. But um, enjoy this. Tell me what you think. But really... To do both right by this, let me put this back on my mug again. Um, to really do this right, and to really vet this, what we really need to do is um, sit down with, with, with some version of a kind of chart, and here's a bunch of my scribblings and ramblings and so forth. Um, with all kinds of other notes and calendars and everything else, is to look ahead and see, well, to really test this, and to see if this is viable, we got to push everything out a year, two years, or three years. Maybe just for fun, jump out like two more years ahead and see if, if everything still squares and fits. Because your leap years vary a little bit as far as where, the, where you land. And there could be a pocket in there that takes 30 days out. So there's only two leap years, which adds only two months um, to this time frame. And that would change the math and change how things fall with the holy days, right? It might make it work or it might really mess things up where it doesn't work. You tell me. Um, let me know. Um, I might geek out on this more later, but I've got a cold and I've got to probably take a couple of ibuprofen, drink some more coffee, do something, and rest. Um, and uh, enjoy it. And I... I Hope that you're blessed by it, and I hope it encourages you to dig into the Word and pick this apart and be the Berean. Always, always, as we read in Acts, be like the Bereans who tested everything Paul said by running to the scrolls, running to the books, checking Scripture, and verifying everything. Um, I am not, like I said, I'm not date setting, but I'm excited to watch every year. Um, the other four feast days, the three spring feasts, and and uh, Pentecost or Feast of Weeks has already been fulfilled as Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit. Um, so the next feast day that needs to be fulfilled is trumpets. And um, that will be obviously second coming type of stuff. And it all happens in the month of Tishri. It's all within one month um, as far as where the dates land. Of course, there could be a spread of seven years between how those land. And um, you know how that goes. If there's uh, seven years, then those dates, those holidays pop up. Those holy days pop up seven times. So enjoy that. And uh, give me your thoughts. 
one more quick word I wanted to clarify because again I'm a little bit out of my mind with with this cold but let me try to clarify I've noticed that it looks like in the chart and in the Bible when it gives time times and half a time or when it says uh, 1260 days 1260 days God I didn't make it clear enough that 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 God does not have them all linked together he breaks them up in different sequences. You've got something that mentions 42 months, 1260, 1260, three and a half years of the whole seven years. And I notice that they don't all necessarily run together because you, you have, it appears that you have this, this block here of time, this big spread of time, uh, seven years, and that you could have 1260 over here and you can have 1260 over here there might be some overlap as they move because these blocks of time notice please that they are set apart separately and they could overlap a little bit or they could run in my the way i have the chart set up they run kind of close to the middle but don't touch so in other words you've got 1260 days of the witnesses i don't even have the two witnesses coming onto the scene until um, 10 days in. In other words, you've got Feast of Trumpets, and then you've got um, Yom Kippur 10 days later. So I have Day of Atonement, just because. It doesn't have to be that way. I have Day of Atonement is when the, the 1260 days start for the two witnesses. And, and it runs. It doesn't even reach um, uh, Passion Week in uh, April 2027 doesn't cover that whole area so you've got this whole block in the in the middle of a couple weeks there's some wiggle room because we're going to have the antichrist satan possessed by antichrist come onto the scene desecrate the temple uh, and you know the after the 1260 days is when the two witnesses were killed so there's four days four days there and there's some overlap and then israel's going to respond so there's like another week there because the passion week's about you know, it's about a week, okay? So there's some time there for them to react and for them to head to Petra. And then you've got 1260 days for them to be nourished or time, times, and half a time for them to be nourished in the wilderness. So notice that they, they are not end to end is what I'm saying, those time periods. So note that, okay? Thank you.